Miss Roy, thank you so much for joining us on America's Now. What are some of the biggest problems facing indigenous people today around the world? One of the biggest problems we have is in relation to recognition. Because in many countries of the world, indigenous peoples are not recognized to the full extent of allowing the protection, the promotion, and the recognition of their rights, their identity, their cultures, their languages. And this is the same issue when you look around the world, whether it be in different regions, in different countries. Of course, there are differences in different countries and across regions as well. In some ways, Latin America has been the most progressive and the most advanced in terms of recognition of indigenous people's rights. They have had constitutional amendments, constitutional processes, policies to recognize indigenous peoples. In other regions of the world, there have been some steps forward. For instance, we now have in um, Congo Brazzaville, for instance, they have a specific law which is on recognition of indigenous peoples, which is a major step forward. In Asia, for instance, the Philippines, you have an Indigenous Peoples' Rights Act. And in other countries across Asia, there are varying levels of recognition. And in, let's say, in Scandinavia, in the Scandinavian countries, in Norway, Finland, and Sweden, you have parliaments that recognize and are for and uh, led by indigenous peoples themselves, the Sami. You mentioned some of the problems, but has there been progress over the years? What have you noticed? It's kind of like a some steps forward, half a step back. So in that way, I believe strongly that this position and the situation of the recognition of indigenous peoples is much, much, much better now than it was, let's say, 30 years ago. And in some, to some extent, the UN has played a role in that. But of course, this has only come about, first and foremost, because indigenous peoples themselves have mobilized, have been able to get the support and coordination and solidarity around the movement. And of course, with the support of the member states, because otherwise things would not have happened. One of the major steps is that in 2007, September, the UN adopted a UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And this was with only four votes against the adoption of the declaration. And even those four votes, the countries that voted against the adoption have since reversed their position. So now there is like global consensus around the declaration and this provides around the world a framework for dialogue, for cooperation, for working together. And also another step forward has been that the UN now has three mechanisms on the rights of indigenous peoples. There is the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, of which I, I work as the, at the Chief of the Secretariat. We also have the Expert Mechanism on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and the Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So they are steps forward. We also had in 2014 a high-level event of the General Assembly, which is known as the World Conference on Indigenous Peoples. And this led to a number of uh, decisions that were then taken up and followed. And amongst these is a system-wide action plan on the rights of Indigenous Peoples, which was agreed by the UN system themselves and is now currently in implementation. However, challenges remain and we still hear reports every year of uh, abuses, of dispossession, displacement, even sometimes of gross human rights violations that occur. And these are all reported to the UN from different, different uh, partners, but of course mainly also from the indigenous peoples themselves. One big concern over the years has been the loss of language uh, among indigenous populations. Uh, 2019 is the year of indigenous languages. Do you feel that languages are disappearing faster than ever before? I know there's been a very big push to preserve all of this. I will speak now in my own mother tongue, Chakma, which is, uh, and I'll just say, do do. Now, I am 
illiterate in my own mother tongue, which is a, an embarrassment for me. I hope to have some time to actually learn my language. And this in itself is an indication of indigenous languages that are not being given the attention, the action, and the support needed to make sure that they continue. And this is what the UN General Assembly in its wisdom agreed to proclaim because they believed very strongly that there was a need to take greater, make, have concrete actions, proposals, so that the rest of the languages that have not yet disappeared can be preserved, revitalized and continue. Now to this end, there have been also quite a few efforts, in fact, from a number of UN agencies, of course, and governments, but also from indigenous peoples themselves who are making efforts and strides to make sure that their own languages are vibrant, are there to pass on to future generations. Because when you speak of languages, this in a way is very closely tied to your culture and your identity. Words that you say in your own language are often not easily translatable to another language. I know that for myself, that when I'm speaking of issues that are close to my heart, sometimes that is when I will speak of in my own mother tongue. So yes, there are steps taken and there will be more progress in terms of retaining and preserving and revitalizing indigenous languages. The UN has done a lot for women. We're seeing more female presidents of countries, prime ministers, and we're seeing a lot of women run for office now. Um, so two-part question for you. In your time, in your experience, how have you seen the role of women change? And, and is that having any impact on indigenous women? and how they're trying to move ahead. Yes, women are taking much more control of their own lives, their destinies, and we have more and more women who are entering the political sphere, the public sphere, and taking leading roles. For instance, at the General Assembly, we have a woman as the, prime, as the president, uh, the foreign minister expert, Maria Espinosa, who's the Ecuador. foreign minister That's of right. Ecuador. Now she's the president of the General Assembly. Which is fantastic. So it's with great pride that we say that. Also at the UN, the Secretary General has made it one of his priority areas that there should be at least 50-50 gender parity at the United Nations. And he has taken concrete steps to that, appointed many women to leadership positions and also had women throughout the system, not just at all levels, coming in. Having said that, there of course remains sometimes a gap. You have women who are very strong, very articulate, yet are sometimes not given the space or the opportunity to come forward and present their voices. And I'm sure there are many of our mothers and sisters out there who, if they had the opportunity, would also come forward and play a leading role in their lives of their countries and their communities. When we come to indigenous women, indigenous women are often targeted and we say it's a threefold basis. One is because they're women, two is because they're indigenous, and three, most often or not, they are among the most marginalized in this, let's say, the socioeconomic strata. And so on this threefold basis for indigenous women, it's even more of a struggle to come forward and say that, look, yes, we are here, we will be here. And you have to also remember that for indigenous women, they are also the ones who are the transmitters of their identity, their culture, their languages. There is also a certain amount of discrimination. And this is general and also for indigenous women. I come from an indigenous background. In, I'm a Chakma from uh, the hill tracks in Bangladesh. And I remember when I was wanted to study law, which is seen as a very much male dominated uh, field. And I wanted to go abroad and study or I wanted to go. Many of them told my parents, don't waste your money on your daughter. Save your money for the son. But I was very privileged and very lucky. I had very progressive parents, very supportive. My father was incredibly supportive and said, no, equal opportunity. 
for all my children. And so I went and studied law. And But this also means that you have to have the support of your brothers, your fathers, your sons, as well as of the other women in your in your uh, sphere of influence, you know, your mothers, your grandmothers. Indigenous women around the world are being targeted. And we have had many instances of indigenous women who have been abused, assaulted, with grievously in some cases, and often have also been killed because they are making their voices heard and coming forward and speaking up for their communities, for their peoples. And these are very serious situations which I think have got to stop. It is not a question of trying to do it. It's a question of making sure such things do not happen to our girls and to our women. So more work needs to be done. Chandra Roy Hendrickson, thank you so much no, for joining us. Thank you us. very much. It's very good to be here with all of you. Thank you for having me.